has taken a strong position, the League U.S., that it is essential for there to be a public option. Or I take it that you would say that if it could be passed, you would vote for a bill that would not have the public option? Yeah, I, uh, yes, I would. Uh, I've, I've um, never believed that I'm in Congress to make uh, perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, and I believe that voting against uh, a, a health insurance bill that reforms the market, that reforms health insurance conduct, that funds things like comparative effectiveness testing, uh, that does all the other good things that we want uh, because a public option isn't included, uh, is making uh, perfect the enemy of, of the good. I don't want to vote, if I, I'm not one of those guys who says if I don't get 100% of what I want, I'm going to vote against the 60%. I'll vote for the 60% and hope that we can build on that. Answer, the question is, is, why are we looking to spend so much money when we don't have it to cover, to, to fix a very small portion? Let's just fix the portion and not scrap the whole thing. That's try and, uh, and, and respond. Um, first of all, I, I actually have shared your concern with respect to... I, I share your concern... I share your concern with respect to the cost. One of the concerns that I've had with this bill from the outset is I want to know how much it's going to cost and how we're going to pay for it. I think that's a fundamental obligation. Now, that doesn't, I'm not standing here and saying I'm going to vote against the bill. I am standing here and saying that I told the Speaker of the House before we left I couldn't vote for a bill without knowing the full costs, and I thought we had an obligation to listen to people for a month rather than bulldozing this thing through. And she listened. She listened. She said, okay, we'll, we'll come back in September. And I do have some, some very specific questions about how we're going to pay for this. With respect to the, the CBO, this, in fact, it was a CBO that, uh, that forced Congress to hit the reset button uh, back in July when it said the, the, the bill that was first introduced wasn't paying for itself. And uh, the House and Senate had to go back to the drawing board and figure out how it's going to pay for itself. So CBO uh, has actually been pretty, uh, pretty well disciplined. And it's not partisan. You know that. It's not partisan. In saying, you better find a way to, to pay for this. Look, I, I absolutely understand. You know, a trillion, $1.3 trillion is a, uh, you know, it's a vast sum of money. It's a vast sum of money. And I don't believe that we ought to be just throwing dollars out the window. I do believe that the cost of doing nothing is going to exceed the cost of doing something. I'll tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Two trillion dollars a year is what we spend on health care on the status quo. Two trillion dollars a year. That's Medicare. That's uncompensated care. That's the cost of the uninsured. That's everything. Two trillion dollars a year. Your premiums, maybe not you specifically, but the average premium for the average American doubled in the past eight years, doubled. Yes. Not because of you, because of the cost of health care. Now some people would say, well that's because of defensive medicine. And other people would say, well that's because we're insuring a bunch of people that we shouldn't, you know, that right. we're letting people yeah. go to public yeah. insurance yeah. rooms and we shouldn't be doing that. It's, it's a combination of all of those things. So deal it's with those problem. first. Don't take the whole house down. Right. But you know, my home Make sure you don't broke it. Uh, we can talk in circles, circles, circles. You may, listen, you may not like my view, well, you're talking but that's... No, 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 no. You're asking me for an explanation. I'm trying to provide the explanation. And if you're not happy with the explanation, I respect your unhappiness. No, 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 no. no. Now, again, I'm going to remind you that when you say you're representing us, I am representing over 600,000 people, some of whom agree with you, some of whom disagree with you, most are in the middle. And so my obligation is to listen to everyone, which is why we are here. Again, you are... No, 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 sir, 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 sir. That would be a good idea. Thank you. And I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Okay. All right, so on the issue of the uninsured, you, you know, you raise a very good point. Nobody's been able to really define how many uninsured there are. There are some people who, who have said to me, the only people who are uninsured are the illegals who come here, and I'm not, I'm not paying for that. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. They're about, according, not according to me, uh, according to most nonpartisan objective estimates, 50 million people, between 45 and 50 million people in America today who don't have health insurance. Of that, 30 million, 30 million are what are called working poor. 
They have jobs. They're making less than double the poverty. They're making less than double the poverty level. So they're making about forty thousand dollars in a family of four, and they just can't afford health care. Their employer doesn't give them health care. They're working a job. They're working two jobs. They can't afford health care. They go to the emergency room. It costs you, sir, eleven $1 hundred dollars every time they show up at the emergency room. They're citizens. They're taxpayers. It costs you eleven $1 hundred bucks when they show up at the emergency room. About thirty million of those fifty million. So yes, you're right. We've got to help. We ought to do something so that they can get on insurance. The other part that you're talking about are the people who don't want insurance. Uh, these are people who are generally young, and some of them are very affluent. About five million of these people are probably making over seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Okay, and they don't want health insurance because it's too expensive. Well, guess what? When they get sick, they end up going to the emergency room. It's costing you eleven hundred dollars so that they can forego health insurance and rather spend it on a Springsteen concert. And I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. And, 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 who just said not true? I say, I've been there and I've come in and I get a bill and I pay it. That's my option. No, 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 no. Are you, excuse me, I said five million of them. I did, I, not including you or your kids. I didn't make a blanket statement. So I said five million of the 50 million. I'm out of insurance. If I want to pay as I go, I should have that option. My friend. You tell me that I can't. My friend. Come on, let's I, I'm, I'm not saying that. You, you, you want so much to yell at me that you're not listening to me. So, again, I will say it again. Of the 50 million, 5 million, evidently not including you, uh, choose not to have health care. And I think that that is, if they end up, for those who are not as responsible as you are, my friend, uh, and pay the bill for the doctor, uh, it is not fair for, for people here to have to pay for their health care when they do go to the emergency room. Uh, and by the way, they're generally healthier. And now you're going to say I'm talking in circles, so forgive me for this. But as a matter of actuarial policy, you want a healthy population included in the insured because they bring down the cost of health care for everybody. And so that's what we need to be getting at. Now, I understand your, 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 the basic point is fix what's broken and don't fix the whole thing. But until, but in my view, with all due respect. It's a combination of all of these things, and we've got to take it as, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as one comprehensive issue. But I will repeat what I said before. I'm a pragmatist. I'm not going to vote against 50% if that's what we end up with, because I couldn't get 100%. If we end up fixing stuff incrementally as a foundation, and then we can move on from there, I'm going to support that. And I must tell you, I've read 1,038 pages of this bill. I have no clue what it says, yeah. and I know the business. You need to have somebody in your world write something in English that is not 1,038 pages that we can read and understand so that we can have a better dialogue because the things that we're debating here, no one has a clue what they're talking about. Because if you listened to, happened to watch Meet the Press yesterday, you would have seen that even the pros don't know what they're talking about. So how do I expect you to vote or, or share your opinion with me when I know I don't understand it and I know you don't understand it? So how do you know I don't understand it? I said some of it. Because some of the things you said show me that you're not well versed with page 974. And neither is the president who admitted it three times last week that he doesn't know what it says. Tell me what I said that shows you that I don't understand page 974, Fred. What's on page 974? I don't have page 974. Tell me, no, no, you specifically said, you specifically said, on page 974, yeah. I have no clue what that says. But Thank I, you. I can tell I you. Understand, I understand, you know, I understand the point that you're trying to make. That right. You can't okay. make a decision right. on something that you don't understand. Okay. All right. All right. Next question. Again, and again, I don't understand it. Again, and I understand what I'm reading. I appreciate it. Okay, let's go to number nine because we are running out of time. Yes, sir. My name is Paul. I have two quick questions yes, for sir. you. I've been a union member for 26 years. Mm -hmm. I do not support national health care. Mm -hmm. Do you understand our fear out here when you have uh, terms like quality adjusted life years, when you have people like Ezekiel Emanuel, Pete Singer, John Holdren oh, right. involved in, in crafting this health care? Do you understand our fear and why people will, will be afraid of the death panels, quote unquote, because you have Earl Blumenauer, please, Shh. Earl Blumenauer, a congressman from Oregon. Oregon has legal assisted suicide, and they wouldn't give Barbara Wagner a year ago drugs to continue her life. But they sent her a letter that said, but we will pay for a doctor to kill you. 
That was Oregon, and Earl Blumenau wrote the section of the bill on the end-of-life counseling. Yeah. So do you understand our fear? That's my first question. Do you understand our anger and our mistrust when you're taking credit for not bulldozing this through? But we all know that the Democratic Party and Barack Obama wanted this done before the August recess. So our fear, our anger, and our mistrust. Thank you. First of all, of course I understand your fear, because if I believed that the federal government was actually going to create genocide panels, which would be empowered to kill your mother, I'd be very afraid. It's a lie. It's an out and out lie. Why are there end of life cancer checks? Not only for the agent, not only for the agent, but for when people get sick. It's not just for the agent, it's for when people get sick. Okay. Okay, so let's. I think, I think it's, again, it's important for us to have disagreements based on fact, okay? So, you make okay. points about Ezekiel Emanuel. No, 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 how many of you that believe, raise your hand, how many of you believe that, uh, that, that the federal government is going to create death panels not that, uh, that will... Not how many of you I said believe... so-called, so-called death panels. We know the rationing is going to lead to people dying. How many of you believe that the federal government will actually make determinations on whether a plug is pulled? Right here. From right here. All right. You so, so here's what we're going to I'm sorry. We Never, excuse me, i got to correct you. Never tell me what I believe. No, I should raise a hand. That's what you were for. You just no, raise your, you raise your hand when you ask us to raise our hand. That's so. confusing. Uh, all right, so if you want to have a conversation, we can have a conversation. But if you want to play, you know, we're playing. Uh, the idea, the idea, the idea uh, for end-of-life decisions came from a senator in Georgia named Johnny Isaacson. You know, you mentioned Earl Blumenauer and these other guys. Let me mention another one. Johnny Isaacson, whose American Conservative Union Index is 100%. He's one of the most conservative members of the Senate. Let me, let, me, say, let, let, me, let me tell you what he said. Johnny Isaacson came up with this provision. And he said that the, the provision would let Medicare pay doctors, if they want, to provide patients with information they might need about preparing a living will, providing medical power of attorney, and if they are seeking this kind of advice, end-of-life decisions. The counseling is not mandatory. It doesn't give government any role in determining medical decisions whatsoever. Johnny Isaacson, whose idea it was, said, quote, all it does is empower you to be able to make decisions at a difficult time rather than having the government making them for you. Any other interpretation of that provision, Senator Isaacson said, is just, quote, nuts. So, again, an idea that came from a conservative who said that Medicare should reimburse doctors if they want to have those kinds of conversations and counseling with their patients, not mandatory, not required, and I will tell you, uh, I will not vote for, nor can I imagine any member of Congress voting for something that would give the federal government a specific vote on whether somebody continues, uh, on how they continue end-of-life care. For those of you who don't trust me, I, I, I respect your lack of trust uh, in me, and, uh, and that's what democracy is all about. You can find, uh, you can vote for somebody who you think uh, would do a better job in the next election. Number 10. When I hear you say that you would like to tear the whole house down to rebuild one room. I didn't say that. You did say, you said you want a national health care. Okay. No, no, no. Let him speak. Let him speak. All right, then it, if, if you are not willing to fix the specific problems, but create this massive government takeover, I can only think it's about power. Because if we dealt with, and on, on the bill it says, the bill's for all Americans. But we know the way Lloyd is right. It doesn't say American citizens. The hospitals down on the southern border, and doctor, you may notice, are closing, or the ERs are closing, because they're being inundated with non-paying illegal aliens. When I look at the federal government, when I look at the federal government in the Constitution of 17, 17, 17, 17, 17 powers, you can't run a post office, you can't run Social Security, it's a Ponzi scheme, Medicare's going broke, Medicaid's going broke, the VA is a horror for our heroes. 
and you want me to go into your program? No. It's ridiculous. No. You said that you're willing to bring down the entire house instead of fixing it. In fact, what I said, no, no, Gene, Gene, now in. it's my time. Go ahead. Sit down. Or you can stand up, whatever you prefer. Yeah. What, I did, what I did say to the, to the concern of some people here was that I want to get something done. And I'm not going to vote against 100%. I'm not going to vote against 50% because I couldn't get 100%. That's specifically what I said. And so if the public option comes out, I specifically said I'll still vote for the bill without the public option. So I said the opposite of what you believe. Well, I didn't do a good job of communicating that. I apologize. This lady here made no, a point, no, 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 and, you, and she specified areas that were broken. Okay. And you said I still would rather have a whole national. I didn't care. say I want a whole national. You did say that, sir. Congressman. Gene, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Now, uh, with respect to uh, however you want to call them, undocumented, illegal, whatever. Well, whatever illegal is the word. Illegal, 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 illegal is the word. Illegal. Whatever you want to call them. In fact, in fact, illegal. folks, if we can't even agree on a term, how are we going to have a civil dialogue? Unless you don't want a civil dialogue. Do you want a civil dialogue, or would you rather just call, you know, call out people? Are they illegal or not? I work for you. You tell me how you want to spend our time. You want to just scream about people, or you want to try and get answers from me? Okay. Uh, the, the legislation in the House specifically and explicitly prohibits any kind of federal dollars or subsidies going to people who came here illegally. It's in the bill, in black and white. It was offered as an amendment. It passed, whether you like it or not, it's in there. You may not trust the language, but the language is, is in there exactly the way you would want it. Can you please put down American citizens? And now, and secondly, it says legal citizens. It says legal citizens.